Liquid Television, for those who might not have seen it, was, uh, uh, we call it uh, part funhouse, part laboratory. And the concept was to do a show that had certain pieces that would appear in every episode and some that would appear from time to time as kind of occasional ideas. My name is Susie. We variously called it uh, Sesame Street on LSD and put your favorite TV shows in the blender and hit puree. We had the opportunity to develop different kinds of story and innovate um, storytelling somewhat. I was actually working on Rugrats for Nickelodeon. And I was feeling very frustrated about having characters that were very limited in what they could do and, and things that they could say. And I think that probably Eon Flux came out of my frustration of uh, working with babies and very squat characters who were very clumsy. And I wanted to do something that was just the complete opposite of that. I went to Peter with a very specific request. I said to him, I'd like you to develop something spy versus spy-like, but in your style. Um, I should have known what kind of thing would come from it, but of course, he far exceeded anything that I could have imagined. I definitely wanted to do something that uh, you don't normally see, and I was always very frustrated, very uh, bored with the idea of using very conventional editing, following particular rules and um, getting into conflicts with directors who said that, oh, you can't do that because that's just not done, um, and just trying to break some of those rules. His ability to imagine camera angles and to think cinematically and tell stories cinematically is remarkable. sold it to MTV based on one image, really. Eon standing, I think, on a great mountain of corpses, um, just firing her gun off into the distance. She looked so cool, and the implication of the image was so strong uh, that instantly they wanted to get on board with it. The way she's dressed, the way she looks, the way she moves, um, all of that was, was tailored to kind of um, seduce the viewer. Um, and get them to keep watching, even though they may not understand exactly at every moment what was happening. Eon Flux, quite frankly, was way more action-oriented and way smarter than most of the other stuff that we had. The idea was to present a lot of action which was offered without any explanation. The film actually begins right in the middle or actually towards the end of her mission. And so you're in a position of having to figure out what's happening as it happens and also try to figure out what happened before the film had begun, and that was a strategy to get, try to get viewers to watch them repeatedly, because I knew that on MTV they were going to be run repeatedly. The first episode where you're first introduced to her, it's like very kind of heroic action type of filmmaking. The second one is very slow and kind of static, and uh, we see the opposite side of the violence. It was the same action, but told from the point of view of two green soldiers. And instantly it became clear that Peter was trying to get people to understand that you can look at things from different points of view, that what might seem heroic, that what you might assume is heroic, can in fact be thought of in a very different way. 
From the moment that you took those two pieces together, you knew we were dealing with something completely different from your ordinary animation series. I wanted her to die at the end of the pilot um, just because I thought it would be a subversive thing to do. And the point of the, the pilot episode was to show how futile her whole mission was to begin with. And not only does she die, but she actually fails to accomplish anything, really. Second season, instead of the question being, how's the hero going to get out of it this time, the, the dramatic tension would be, how's Eon going to get it this time? I decided that was going to be her thing. She was going to die in every episode. If you start with the premise that she's always going to die, you can have her do things that a normal character in a, in a recurring series um, wouldn't do. It allowed the character to be completely unrestrained morally. Given the audience that developed around liquid television that showed there was an interest for unusual animation styles and content out there, we were doing other things at the time that explored similar kinds of esoteric Stay. type properties. Sam Keith, The Max. And I'm in. And Eric Fogel's The Head. Take me to your leader. As we got into making Eon Flux as a series, I was thinking this is a fantastic opportunity. This is the kind of property that you don't really see done on TV very often. We felt good that we had a balance between things that we were pushing the edge on creatively, even if we might have a little smaller audience. I had always been interested in telling different kinds of stories in, in unconventional ways, I and mean, that, that was really, you know, my whole interest in, 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 in wanting to be a writer-director. We'd been given a pretty significant amount of leeway on liquid television. Everything was very intense, very concentrated. We were packing an awful lot into these very short periods of time. We wanted to maintain that for the series, but realistically, uh, were we going to be able to do that? It was, uh, you know, just a runaway train of sleepless nights, endless, uh, Conjecture. Getting into Peter's mind is uh, pro probably the most difficult thing about uh, working on this show because it's uh, the most personal show I've ever worked on. The, the single most important thing about the character was that she is self-motivated, that she does not belong to any kind of organization. She's not fighting crime. She's not trying to uphold the law. She's not upholding any kind of ideology or fighting for her country. Everything that she does is personal. She was a little racy and edgy, but that was sort of the point, and everybody knew that from the beginning when you saw the shorts. So the challenge was back to trying to make sure that Peter's vision got on the screen and had integrity, yet could be shown so that a larger audience could see it. I think we were kind of given to, to know right up at that when we were going to series that there would be some concerns from standards. I think fairly rapidly, uh, MTV was disabused of the idea that it could play easily on Saturday morning. There were, of course, various euphemisms, double entendres, hidden meanings, subtexts, that uh, it's quite possible that uh, the MTV executives would have been concerned the audience wouldn't understand. But you see, they didn't understand them either. They didn't even notice them. So we were OK. <laughs> all aware that with the liquid TV things, nobody had said really more than two lines of dialogue, if that. 
and that bringing these voices to these characters that heretofore had only been seen was going to be critical and really uh, a risk. We all initially were kind of challenged with how is that going to happen given this character hasn't had a voice, how's it going to sound, how's it going to work, how's it going to play. I think we wanted to create a, um, a set of voices that weren't distinctively from anywhere. I'm not sure that we even really thought of Monica and Brenya as being on Earth, per se. I knew early on that um, Eon wasn't going to talk a lot. I mean, she's a very secretive character, she's very guarded, and perhaps the most important thing was to make sure that she came across as a smart character, and I wanted that to be reflected in the way she spoke. Tell me why I shouldn't kill you. We're being watched. My name is Eon Flux. I'm here on a mission to assassinate Trevor Goodchild. Is everybody listening? Do you believe me? Everybody happy now? When Denise Poirier was brought in uh, by Jack Fletcher, she just seemed to have a stronger impulse than anyone else that we really had read for the part. I think to develop her voice, it came from a place of real strong motivation. And there was no, you know, no extraneous dialogue. It was very much get the work done and with a sense of humor at the same time. This isn't what I asked for, Ilbrin. All I see here is a lot of money. The search for Eon was critical, but we quickly discovered that it was a partnership. And the Trevor we decided on was going to directly influence the Eon and vice versa. I'm John Lee, and I play the role of Trevor Goodchild. John gave a sort of elegance to the character. He sort of put the smoking jacket onto Trevor, and uh, that seemed to really work. I hold the future of Brenya in my hand. See it, my friends, and embrace it. Embrace! Trevor is an administrator. Eon Flux is an anarchist. Trevor's got to hand it to her because he knows that this incredible hottie has more balls in, in, you know, in her little finger than all you There's obviously this opposition of the two of them philosophically and this uh, lust for each other, which neither of them is completely comfortable with, but which they, they realize they can't overcome. They're probably not the atypical of a lot of people who feel like they've met their, their soulmate at the very wrong time in their life. Go ahead. Kill me if that's what you want. You can't do it. You think you know what I'm doing, so obviously you don't. What I have in mind for you is much worse. They're, they're trapped being pulled together um, by, by circumstance, but when once they get together, they can't, they just don't want to be apart. Trevor's line that uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stranger kind of uh, sums up the combination of sexuality and violence uh, that their relationship encompasses. They have good and bad in them, as do all of us. And uh, most of the shows were about creating ethical and moral dilemmas for them and letting those play out. Peter's definitely trying to make a show that, that makes you sit back and go, wow, what was that about? I don't think MTV has ever had anything nearly as uh, intellectually engaging as the influx on its air. Most of the stories were easy for people to follow, but not all of them. So I think in some ways that maybe we could have opened it up to a little bit of a larger audience. But with that said, I think we were, we maintained the integrity of the original character the way that um, Peter had hoped to. We wanted to explode the envelope of uh, this science fiction uh, vehicle. As we uh, have moved into a period of taking sides globally, um, this demand that we see everybody in black and white, either somebody is good or they're evil, it becomes all the more important that we get reminded, as we do in every episode of Eon Flux, that the world is made of shades of grey. And what might seem like a good idea from one side can be a very, very bad idea from another. It's kind of funny working in Hollywood. Um, things tend to get polarized into either being pure escapism or uh, something didactic. And I'm really not interested in doing either one of those. I'm really interested in getting the viewer to shift his mind into thinking in a new way. And that's really what these shows is about. I, I don't have a specific message that you know I'm hoping that 
that each viewer gets out of the whole series. It's really up to them what they want to take away from it. When you're making a film in any medium, you're never really finished with it. It's just you, you have to deliver it at a certain point. You just have to stop. There had always been parts of the show when they were all finished and, and had aired that I wanted to go back and, and fix. These are the very first Young Flux episodes. Some of the things we're doing for the new enhanced version of the uh, episodes for the DVD is that we're adding some effects in terms of lighting and sh shading, and also um, maybe tweaking the colors a little bit uh, to give it a more varied look, which is possible now, I think, with digital color correction. I'm very excited about the way that the, uh, the remastered version of the episodes looks. Um, just because I think that people who are familiar with the show have seen the shows in, in their original form so many times. And I, I know I have, so I'm interested in presenting them in a, in a brand new way. I think it gives it a new life, and I think that, 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 that uh, fans will appreciate it. Eon Flux, bitch fatale, anarchic chic, she's a death toy. She takes no prisoners, she takes no lip. You're gonna rip a zipper, danger boy. A trip to get a grip on the equipment, but you're under cardiac arrest. This is not a test. She's a death toy, Eon Flux. She's a death toy.